I'm here today with Robert Akerlof, professor of economics at University of Warwick in the UK, and who I want to start by really underscoring to the young scholars who follow this podcast that he is one of the great pioneers in one of the pillars of economics, or say the foundation stones of economics that has to be examined. He is focused on the questions of the relationship between the individual and society, the relationship between what your priorities are, which you might call your self-esteem and esteem from others. He's diving into a very fresh and vital research program that I have found very exciting and felt very fortunate to learn from him and to support. I'll start before introducing our guests with a quote that he shared with me from Clifford Geertz about what is culture. Believing with Max Weber that man is a social animal suspended in webs of significance he himself has spun. I take culture to be these webs. Culture consists of socially established structures of meaning. Robbie, you got to take us on tour because I feel like I'm at sea in the fog without an adequate chart when I think about traditional classical economics to even begin to interpret Clifford Geertz's remark. So thank you for joining me. And uh, how do I say, let's go sailing together. Thank you so much, Rob. It's a pleasure to, to join you. Thank you for that very kind introduction. Um, and I think that that quote by Clifford Geertz is a, a fantastic place uh, for us to begin. Um, this idea that we um, are suspended in webs of significance that we spin um, and uh, that there are sort of social um, uh, understandings that we spin of, of what's meaningful and what is valued. Um, I think that's something that as economists, we need to reckon with more than we have. This is um, something that sociologists, anthropologists know very well, but I think as economists, we um, need to think much more about. We tend to take it as given who people are, and, and, and we then think about uh, the equilibrium of, of how people behave, taking who they are as given. And I think um, that um, we need to, to spend more time thinking about an equilibrium of who people are and what they value, what they care about, and what these webs of significance that they spin are. Well, Robbie, I, I really think the, uh, the questions that the great gadfly H.L. Mencken brought to the table in 1922 in his article, The Dismal Science, cut to the quick, he is saying, in essence, he trusts economists less than anybody except theologians. And the reason he says that is because he says they're not free. They're not free to be individuals because they can imagine the consequences for their career, their social esteem, what have you, by, how do we say, espousing what they observe deep in their heart, that they're the magnetic field of social pressure and hierarchy is twisting their observations and, and perhaps even creating an economics, which is what you might call sterile because of, what do you say, aversion to controversy. And I don't want to beat up economists too much here because I look back to the time of Adam Smith, theory of moral sentiments and the wealth of nations, when a feudal oppressive ruler was supported by the military and by the church. And speaking in moral and ethical discourse created a situation where the distrust of public officials and scholars was magnified because they were associated with the corruption. So the scientific language emerged in an attempt to overcome that corruption in the transformation of society. And yet Mencken is saying everybody who is an expert 
everybody who John Ralston saw calls a rational courtesan has to be mindful of the social consequences of his views or her views, attitudes, ideas, and essentially, how do we carve out the meaning in our life? How, where do you go in your research? What, what nodes, if you want my call, in the building blocks of economics do you begin with as you try to deepen and refine our understanding of how society operates? So I think that, you know, as economists, we tend to model people as individualistic, as having very fixed preferences. We also tend to model people as um, having uh, desires, things they want, uh, but not having um, uh, senses of what's right and what's wrong and being driven by a sense of what's right and wrong and what they ought to do uh, and what other people ought to do. And so I think two key areas that we need to develop, and there's some work um, that's doing so, but I think there's a lot more work to do. I think we need to work on modeling people as social, as subject to social influence. Um, and I think we need to model people as being moral creatures who are driven uh, by moral considerations. And those moral considerations are also uh, social in nature. So what people see as right, as wrong, what people value, what kinds of things people esteem is very driven by their social context. If you go to a particular high school as a student, um, you know, you're shaped by whether that school is a school that values athletics or it values academics or it values um, something totally different. And uh, you join a group in that school and it changes who you are. So that's, that's the kind of thing that, um, that I think we need to consider much more carefully. I have to tell you, I uh, went to public schools in the Detroit metropolitan area and then went to MIT Boy, did I get a turbo charge from my peer group when I went to MIT. There was some really, really awe-inspiring, almost frighteningly intelligent people that became my classmates. And uh, so I, I'm, how would I say, I confess to that influence. By the way, in, in one of your lectures, I also saw another thing that was very interesting because I don't want to beat up on economists like they're some kind of, you know, different kind of creature. You had a little presentation about how referees at sports games tend to call, what was it, 15.5% fewer fouls against the home team. I guess that's what we call home field advantage. And with the Super Bowl coming up and the game being played in Tampa Bay, it'll be interesting to if, see if uh, those referees can maintain their independence with <laughs> Tampa Bay being in the finals. That's right. Um so I, th this uh, uh, experiment that you reference on referees is um, a version really of a classic experiment by Solomon Ash that, that shows that, um, you know, if there are people who give uh, a particular uh, response that um, may maybe it's clear that response is wrong. And then, then you, you've heard that, that response and now it's, it's your turn. Uh, to answer uh, that you're very influenced by that, um, that, you know, in some ways your beliefs may be influenced by what other people say, by some wrong thing other people may say. And, um, and in addition to your beliefs being influenced, uh, people are, are timid about saying something different. They're scared to um, be disesteemed by the group if they say something different. Do you, uh, when you look at, uh, just how would I say, the, the matrix of the United States and social problems, or the mosaic of social problems, I should say, do you see these interactive elements related to esteem or the influence of neighbors or peers or elders or, uh, or even which you might call rebellion against 
toxic elements of society playing a large role in the kind of things we read about in the news? So I think that understanding our, our current uh, political uh, issues in the United States, um, one of the key useful frames for, for doing that is, is thinking about um, people's desire for esteem and the problems that people uh, have in, in obtaining esteem. Um, so, uh, so I think there are a number of threats um, that, uh, that we can talk about to people's esteem right now. And so, um, so let me start with one. So, um, so there's a, a wonderful concept um, that was developed by the sociologist Robert Merton. Um, and the concept is a, is a distinction between locals and cosmopolitans. And the idea here is uh, that if you, let's say you're a college professor. Um, so if you're a college professor, uh, you can you can go more or less anywhere, and uh, and being a professor is something that's recognized uh, and that people accord a kind of value to, um, and that that's a notion uh, for Merton of being a cosmopolitan that your esteem isn't particularly rooted in in a place, um, but for a lot of people, maybe most people, um, esteem is very rooted to. A, a place uh, and a community. So for instance, maybe you were um, the star of, uh, of the football team at your high school uh, when you were growing up. And maybe as and people within that community remember that and recognize that. And on that basis, maybe you set up a business and uh, for instance, maybe you set up a car dealership. And people um, give you respect in the community and come to your business because um, of uh, the fact that you were a star on that football team and that means something in that community. And um, so I think a concern is that as, as many communities are disappearing, many people are losing um, that uh, key reservoir. Um, of esteem that they have and, and place uh, in uh, an identity for themselves. Um, and, um, and that's something that um, the cosmopolitans may fail to fully appreciate um, that, that that's a threat because it's not, not a threat that they themselves face. So I think that's, that's one example of a threat to esteem. And, um, and, and so I think that's one kind of thing that's, um, that's that's putting pressure on on people and and causing them to um, to be concerned about our current institutions. Um, we can talk about some other threats to identity, but I think that broadly speaking, these threats to identity are causing um, people to question our institutions and lose faith in government. Well, I know uh, my friend and. Former senior fellow at INET, Michael Sandel, has recently written a book on the tyranny of merit. Yes. And there is a sense in which those who get the credentials in order to rule, uh, which I might call develop habits of obedience and affirmation within a concentrated elite, and at the same time, those over whom they govern with all of the kind of things Michael cites in his book about what constitutes, you know, virtue and value appear to be very hollow or appear to be unavailable and therefore lead to a despair. And uh, I know in some of his conversations with me, uh, both on this podcast and elsewhere, he's been very concerned about the reconnection of the population's faith in expertise and governance being a necessary condition to some of the, given the, some of the challenges we face that are on the horizon. Absolutely. So, um, so I, I, I completely agree that that's a major issue. So I think, um, 
that one one frame for for thinking about this um, is um, that we face threats to our institutions when um, there are pressures uh, in society that lead some people to to adopt different values, uh, different um, uh, norms uh, from others. Uh, so this is something I've I've written about uh, in my own work. So I've, um, so I've talked about, um, the idea that people care both about what I call pure esteem, a desire to, um, to obtain esteem from their peers. So if you're in a high school and, um, let's say that the dominant culture in that high school is one that values, um, athletic achievement. So you could, you could, uh, you would care in that high school about um, how you're viewed by these other students who care about athletic achievement, and and you'd you know have some desire to um, uh, to excel at athletics too. And if if you do choose to excel at athletics, you might then also choose to adopt those same values and and uh, value athletics. So that would make you part of this general community of athletes and and. Uh, and, and so this desire for pure esteem leads to kind of conformity of values and leads to kind of forming of a common community. Um, but there's, there are other pressures too. So in addition to people caring about pure esteem, they also care about what I call self-esteem. Um, and so self-esteem is sort of ha- rather than how your peers judge you, it's about how you judge yourself according to your own values. and um, and so in that high school, so maybe, uh, you have trouble, um, uh, achieving, uh, a, a, as, as, uh, an athlete. And, uh, and if you do, um, that, that might lead you to want to adopt different values. Um, so you might, for instance, uh, decide that it's important to, instead to value something like academic achievement or, um, achievement, um, it's something totally different. Maybe you're good at music and, um, and so you value, uh, that you're, you're good, uh, good musician. Um, so, um, so, so, um, so there are these pressures that come from the desire for self-esteem that can lead people, uh, to peel off of, the majority culture and form what one might call an oppositional culture. And um, so I think that when oppositional cultures form, um, that can potentially be a real challenge uh, to our institutions. So so those folks who are oppositional may not feel that existing institutions are legitimate and, um, and, and, um, and, and that may that may be uh, a real issue. Uh, since uh, that you're right, you know, you can kind of, what was the old song? I think Linda Ronstadt or uh, Laura Nero sang a different drummer. Yes. People, people sometimes realize they can't make it. I'll, I'll tell you an example in my life. I had a girlfriend in high school whose older sister, knew a lot of NBA players. And one day we went to Kobo Arena where the Detroit Pistons were playing and their star center was a man named Bob Lanier. He was six foot 11 and he had a beautiful pair of hands, meaning he could shoot a three pointer and a very high percentage making it. So I walked out with my girlfriend and her sister and, and shook hands with him. And then he let me stand there while he was warming up and he took a rack of balls and he hit six three pointers in a row. So here I was at about five foot eight, and him at six foot eleven, and he had the shots like a point guard. And I always visioned myself as a point guard. And I walked back to my girlfriend and I said, "God just told me I'm not going to be a basketball player." And she laughed, and it was. But it, I was just in awe of the pure power of this man's ability, and I could see it wasn't going to be my calling. And how did I say? So you go in different, you go in different directions. But, but I think right now, one of the problems 
is that people feel that the avenues or the pathways to prosperity or satisfying life or being a leader of a family or whatever are getting fewer and narrower and more expensive, more obstacles, and not just monetary expense. And I think some of the distrust in what I'll call democratic capitalism is the feeling like the rungs in the ladder are withering or disappearing. And how, how, do you, how do you address that as a social policy when we do, as Emil Durkheim emphasized, have religious needs, communal needs, and nourishment as a source of strength and support at the same time as making the sacred object the individual and individual freedom when a lot of individuals are despairing and don't think they can make it in the system. It just feels, it feels like a dangerous cocktail for what you might call adherence to anything. And that void, that despondency invites an authoritarian reaction. Absolutely. So I think we were talking earlier about um, threats uh, that people face to building identity and obtaining the esteem of others. And so one of them I identified is uh, loss of community. So I think that's one major box that we, we need to, to think about addressing. Um, and I think, so you're raising others. So I think another huge box to tick is, is family. So um, you know, family is a place that's a kind of reservoir of identity and esteem for people, at least traditionally. And we've seen um, a big decline in um, in sort of the two parent traditional kind of family. And um, uh, so we there there are a lot a lot more just single people. There are, uh, people you know at any rate. That, so one term that um, that sociologists use is fragile families. There are many more fragile families. So family has become uh, a much less uh, stable source of esteem for people. Um, and, and that's often been, a, I think, a, you know, suppose you um, you aren't getting esteem from your community or the other, another area I wanted to address is, is jobs. Suppose you're not getting esteem from your jobs. People have traditionally been able to fall back on family as a source of esteem. And, and, um, and that's something that people are less able to rely upon. So, so family is a problem just as community is a problem. And then, yes. And then there's, let me just ask you, is that, is that inability to rely on family because of what you call modernization or transportation and geographic disbursement or is, or is there some other dimension that is at the core of this? So I've been doing some work recently with, Luis Rayo, who's at Northwestern, on families. And what we argue is that, um, that you know, econ so let, let me take a step back here. So economists normally, so if you think about the Becker model of families, economists normally think of families um, sort of as little factories. So they're, they're very economic in nature and... Um, uh, and, you know, if there's, uh, there might be a division of labor within the family with a wife who's doing uh, home production and a uh, man who's going out and doing market production. So there's this sort of little factory notion uh, of what the family does. Um, so what we argue is that, um, that there are very different things that people care about uh, if you look at different families. Um, that we have to, to, to think carefully about what exactly um, it is that the family cares about and values. This comes back to our, the very first part of our discussion, that um, what people care about is flexible, uh, it's changeable, it's, sh it's shaped by social context. So we argue that there, there are different things that, that families care about. And... Um, so if you if you look in the data, you you can see very clearly that there are, there are sort of different types of families. So in particular, one might distinguish between families that are more traditional, uh, 
and families that are more modern. And we argue that what these families care about and drives them is very different. And that over time, there's been um, a change in what family, a broad trend uh, in term, in, in, with families more having this kind of modern set of, of values. Um, so, so this is changing. And I, I think that that's one thing that's driving um, a decline in marriage rates, a decline uh, in, uh, in fertility rates of families. So I think that's, that's one thing that we're seeing that's changing what families um, look like. Um, I think another thing is that for these more traditional families, there are economic pressures um, that they're facing that's also causing um, pro- problems for them. So in particular, um, there's been a decline uh, in um, sort of traditional type of work that men do. So, I mean, in particular, um, you know, there's, there's been a decline in manufacturing jobs, the kind of jobs that, that, um, that men have been able to do to be breadwinners within traditional families and, um, and, and support a family. And so, um, so for these men, they, they, um, they're not able to occupy that traditional role that in that family model, they're supposed to occupy. And that's, um, leading to, um, uh, to break up of families. So, uh, so you're seeing among these traditional families or these traditional types, you're, you're seeing a decline in marriage rates. Um, so one could call this crisis, a crisis of masculinity. So that's a term that's often used for this. And one's also seeing, I think, particular problem for those men who, who are suffering from this crisis of masculinity. So they're um, responding to that um, in various ways. So it's it's causing, for instance, um, you know, uh, the, I think it's a source of things like opioid use, which is a, a big problem. And I think um, this is, is one of the things that's been uh, driving uh, people towards Donald Trump. Do you do you see um, what you might call the traditional, you know, father knows best kind of uh, model disintegrating? The what I I think you called it in the uh, paper you shared with me the protector model. That's right. As opposed to the fulfillment model. How, how does that relate to uh, what you might call the, the choices people make, both in time, the nature of partners, uh, and, and what you might call the story of underlying satisfaction? That's right. That's right. So in the paper, we call this a story. So these families have, have a story. Um, and... Um, so um, so let, I'll just give a little bit of a, a sense um, of what we see as a kind of key kernel of um, this traditional family story. And, and uh, I think that's useful. So, um, so what we argue is that sort of a key thing that drives these families in a variety of ways is, um, is a concern. Uh, so I think, so if you, uh, so there's, there's this idea of um, purity and pollution. One sees this, for instance, in the work of Jonathan Haidt. So these mm-hmm. families think very much in terms of purity and pollution, we think. And there's a concern about, um, about uh, being made impure. Um, so, I mean, let, let me give a concrete example. So if you watch a film like uh, The Godfather, um, so in that film, there's this idea that going and working uh, uh, for the family business, being in the mafia, that's something that's polluting. And they want to protect certain members of the family from that kind of pollution. So the women of the family are kept out. And so, so we argue that this is a key thing that, is, that drives these distinct roles to form within those families that um, there are certain people who are going to be protected and kept pure, and other people are going to do this work of breadwinning and going out and exposing themselves to a kind of pollution. And they're, as a result, they're going to have to kind of adopt, adopt a tough veneer and be tough 
And so you get these two very different types of people forming in those families. And a lot of the identity for um, the men in these families uh, is comes from being protectors. Um, so the whole story of the Godfather is really a story of keeping a son pure. So it's the son, Michael. And, and the whole mm-hmm. story is about um, the failure of the father to protect the son and the kind of tragedy of, uh, of, of his inability to protect that son and keep him out of uh, the family business. So I think one way to view um, this crisis of masculinity problem uh, is that these men who care deeply about uh, this task of protection, that's a lot of what their identity is wrapped in, uh, up in, um, are finding that they're having trouble being protectors. Um, so I think you, you mentioned also, is this model crumbling? I think that there, this model is becoming less prevalent. So you can see that clearly in the data in the, for the United States and uh, for a number of other countries too, it's becoming less prevalent, but it's still uh, a very strong, uh, uh, strongly present narrative. So it's not disappearing. Um, and um, it's also becoming much more um, predictive, which story you have, this more modern story uh, or this more traditional story. It's becoming very predictive of your politics, um, whether you're Republican or you're a Democrat. Hmm. Well, you, you know, you've uh, we've focused on the family and focused on some aspects of education, but we've seen, uh, and I saw this in one of your lectures, uh, that the, the what you might call the structure and the nature of education reform, contrasting uh, the woman from what's her name Michelle Ree, yes, in Washington D.C. charter schools, what I'll call kind of top-down incentives and control, and then uh, Andrea Gabor, who I've had the good fortune to interview in the past at INET, oh, fantastic, and her vision of the Deming type model of the how do I say bottom-up giving trust and faith to the locals who, I would say, should care and nurture the system for the satisfaction of their own community. And how, how are you seeing, which I call the political lessons from what we've experienced and also how people align themselves vis-a-vis the structure of education? So uh, that's a great question. Um, so I think you're getting to, um, I think, a, a really important big issue, which is um, we have in economics a very particular um, notion of how people are incentivized. Um, so if one thinks, uh, to give a very simple example of uh, Gary Becker's model of crime, um, what he writes is... Um, that the more you, you punish people um, when you observe a crime, even if it were, say, a very petty crime, um, the more uh, you're able to deter crime. So more punishment, uh, less crime. So, you know, if you could, you should, you should just boil people in oil whenever you see them committing a crime. That's the kind of lesson. And I think that's a lesson that... Um, generally in incentive theory, we see um, that there's that message that, um, that you, you know, it, w- whenever you can punish it, whenever you observe misbehavior, you should really punish it. And that's going to incentivize uh, people well. Um, and um, if we think about this in uh, the space of crime, there, there's, there's another um, idea. Um, so one sees this uh, there are a number of legal scholars who've written about this, people like Tracy Mears and Tom Tyler, who argue that actually um, we need to think really hard about how to make the legal system legitimate. So if we don't punish crimes in a way that people see as fair and measured and appropriate, if we don't have processes, processes of adjudicating um things that is seen as fair and legitimate if 
for instance, uh, African Americans are treated very differently by police and by the legal system uh, from whites. That these are things that are going to delegitimate um, the um, the whole system for people, um, and um, and so so we have to think about. Um, how to create institutions that are, are legitimate. And that's not, um, that, that, that's, that, so one gets diff- very different answers if one thinks in that space of trying to create legitimacy. So the kind of problem that you have in, in policing, uh, if, um, if, the, uh, if, if things aren't seen as legitimate, is no one will work with the police. Uh, the police cannot police effectively unless people work with them and report things to them. So if we now turn to schools, which is is where you started, I think the same issues come up within schools. The same kinds of issues broadly come up within organizations. So there was a movement um, that maybe one could um, cite Jack Welch um, from General Electric as kind of an early proponent of this idea. He's one of his nickname is Neutron Jack. So his his idea was let's um, let's let's uh, let's just on a regular basis assess people and fire poor performers. Um, and the idea was that that's that's really going to uh, give people strong incentives um, to work hard and to behave. So that kind of logic. So there's a, a term rank and yank for. Um, for this kind of system where people are regularly ranked and the worst performers are yanked, this has become uh, quite a common practice for many businesses. And, um, and, and I think this is then something that's been applied to education. So that's, that's the kind of practice that was motivating Michelle Rhee as uh, the DC uh, commissioner for, uh, for schools in um, doing things like, uh, you know, firing. A, so she fired a, a principal um, on television. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I think there's a there's a logic to it. And she, she was very passionate about it. Her her view was these are these are poor performing people and we need to put incentives in place for them. And so um, I think um, there's some truth to that. But I think what's what's missing um, from that way of thinking is that it's not just about putting incentives in place, but it's also about create. It's also about changing who people are and getting them to be uh, to value the things that the organization values. Um, that it's um, it's well, the most important thing is not that people have incent have sort of clear say monetary incentives to behave, but that they really care as teachers about being teachers, that they care about their jobs, that they're mission driven. And it's important to treat them in a way that that's consummate uh, with that. So the, in the work of Andrea Gabor, um, she really argues that um, the, the job of schools is to um, is to do that, to kind of create um, the right values. And, and she has a kind of small D democratic view of how schools should operate, that, um, that there's, it's important to listen to teachers, to give them voice, and uh, by giving them voice, by including them, you uh, will hopefully make them more mission-driven. I'm uh, quite taken by this, what you might call subchapter in our conversation. I wanted to share with you that uh, you sent me back to what I find was a very powerful experience in my life when I read about uh, a gentleman named Ramsey in Merchant Marines, mm. because you talked in that instance about, uh, or, or presented in your your deck, about how when officers appear to create rules and expect obedience that if there isn't a deep sense of justice or, or understanding of why it's for the collective good, people engage in what you might call destructive rebellion. Mm. 
And I thought that that story, which you can elaborate on, was, was a very important one. It's analogous to the law enforcement issues. But the experience I had was that I had a father who was a physician, spent four years in the Pacific around the time of the Korean War. And uh, he was the physician on the ship and a gentleman uh, whose name was Admiral Robbins. Well, his name was Captain Robbins at the time, asked my dad to come home with him to Coronado near San Diego as he was promoted to an admiral. And as it turns out, I was named Robert because I was conceived at the time when my mom and dad met, when my dad came home. And my dad wanted to name me Robbins. My mother was from Scotland. She said, no, it's got to be Robert. And my dad said, okay, but it can't be Bob. It, it can only be Robert, Robbie. So in that, that you and I share. Indeed. Uh, but, the, uh, but the interesting thing was that I gave a talk one night in New York where somebody said, can I, Q&A said, can I call you Bob? And I said, no, you can't. The audience looked at me like I was a jerk. And I said, no, no, folks, my parents are both deceased and they had this big agreement. And if I said, yeah, you can call me Bob, I'd be afraid you, you might get hit with a lightning bolt. <laughs> and everybody laughed and it dispelled. So I walked off the stage and the gentleman says to me, do you know that I lived in Coronado and I knew Admiral Robbins? And I said, wow, that's great. And he said, I didn't know your dad. It was after the time your dad had left. But he said, uh, do you know Robert Coons? Because he has a naval program that people go and they spend time, like on the aircraft carriers. And I said, no, I've never heard of him, never met him. Well, the next day, Robert Coons called me. We talked about it. I had an urn of my father's ashes he wanted distributed in the Pacific. And about a year and a half later, the guy called me and said, you're on deck this July in 2019, you're going to go on the Nimitz. And I went there and I, you know, I have to say my propensity is to worry that the military industrial complex maybe uh, through rent seeking gets too much of our resources given our other needs. But I went on the Nimitz and I watched this captain and this crew and men and women and people of color with about as high a level of functioning and morale. And I'm talking about on an aircraft carrier with 44,200 people. It's like a little city afloat. Mm. But I watched from the top, the gentleman that was the captain was a, a graduate of Duke University. I watched how people acted in the dining rooms. I watched in the when they were briefing me on intelligence and how they monitored things all over the world, African-American and Latino women, sharp as a tack and totally building their confidence. And I came home and I said to myself, we have to be able, I, whether, whether the mission of military preparedness taken to the level of the United States is the right place to allocate money, we have to learn from this culture about how to run companies, societies, school systems. I, I just, I still to this day marvel at the experience I had for those few days. And, you know, at night they'd take me out with earmuffs and, you know, head sound insulation like headphones and watch the, the planes take off from the deck and then land and catch on the wire. And they took me through the whole medical system. They had nine different uh, religious uh, chapels built within this ship. It, it was it was absolutely spellbinding because it was almost like I went in knowing my dad was reverent. I got to spread, you know, uh, how you say, my, my enthusiasm to them about his reverence for that period of his life. But I never thought it would get inside me, and it did. Mm. And uh, so, at any rate, that's a long-winded thing, but that is in marked contrast to the merchant marines. And, and I would say, if you want to say you're skeptical about government, go take the tour on the uh, Nimitz or, or other aircraft carriers and see how affected these people are and reimagine 
whether other elements of the public sector could play a role in our society with that kind of vitality, with that kind of human capital accumulation that all of those young people, they, they, they achieved, but partly they achieved because they felt the place cared for them and nurtured them in, uh, and expected a lot from them. So uh, how would I say? I saw a lot of people over those days that would come and sit and talk to me for a few minutes. And a lot of them had come from very despondent places, had not want to enlist, but did out of a despair or a sense of not knowing where they were going. And they emerged vital. So, so I guess what I'm saying in conclusion of this episode, I think you can build people and communities and the kind of yeah. what we might call the endogeneity of values and preferences and morals and and systems of cultivation that your work entails is a much more optimistic vision than what I will call mechanical icy economics suggests. So I think, I think the military is a perfect example of an institution that views incentives in broad, these broader terms. It's not just about taking who you are as given and uh and and viewing people as self-interested and taking that as a given and then trying to uh give them incentives to behave they view their job as to shape who people are and they're very effective at it as as you're saying and they do a great job of taking people who um you know come from uh disadvantaged backgrounds and giving them a tremendous sense of purpose in their lives they uh do a fantastic job as you're saying of bringing people from different groups together and giving them a sense of common identity and common purpose um and and i completely agree that we need uh to make that a model for um for other organizations uh to follow and i think um, you know, if you, you, there are various, uh, counterpoints to this. I mean, I think one thing I'd note is that economists often have recommended, uh, giving, uh, big bonuses to people and, uh, giving them stock options and things like that. And I think that that kind of attitude, it, it changed. So this comes back to our discussion of stories that changes people's stories and it makes people more concerned with money. And it, 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 uh, diminishes their sense of uh, being oriented toward a, a broader mission uh, for the organization. So I think um, it's very important that we view incentives in these broader terms and and take this view uh, of, of, of um, it's the organization's job to shape uh, who people are. So coming back to your point about the the merchant marines and and this book by Ramsey so Ramsey uh wrote this book after spending several years working in the, the merchant marines so this is this is an organization that that um where incentives seem to be working less well and i think uh this is a case where um it it's less about the organization um uh so sort of taking an economic view of things and, uh, for instance, giving people bonuses. And it's more about they're not sort of building the right culture. So this is an organization where um, there were people who were defined as crew and there were people who were defined as officers. And the officers really looked down on the people who were the crew. And Ramsey relates uh, one, you know, poignant, uh, incident that, uh, that, that sort of shows how this worked. So he talks about how, um, there was a, you know, there's the officer's mess and there's the, the crew's mess and the crew, their, uh, coffee machine, uh, had broken and, uh, and the officers, rather than, you know, giving them a nice new coffee machine, they, they had a, machine from their own mess that they'd stopped using. It had broken. It wasn't working well. And they just gave them that one. And, you know, you could say this is insignificant and this, sh this shouldn't have been a big deal. It shouldn't have affected uh, how hard people work very much, but it reinforced 
to the crew that they just weren't valued and they weren't respected. And it provoked all kinds of acts of sabotage um, by the crew. So, I mean, the kinds of things that the crew uh, did on the ship, they did things like, you know, people who are washing dishes rather than just washing them, they would take some dirty dishes and throw them out uh, of, of the window into the sea. Or they would do uh, things like in ironing uh, an officer's shirt, they would uh, purposefully burn their shirts. So there were all kinds of things they were doing to act out in, in the only ways really that were open to them because they didn't have much voice. They were acting out against um, this sense of disrespect that they felt. And this, this gets back to this idea we were talking about, about oppositional culture. They were looking for a path for self-esteem. And um, they that desire for self-esteem drove them away from being in line with, uh, with the values uh, and, and mission that the officers had. So I think... Um, you know that I I think that that also gets us back to this theme of um, what's happening more broadly in American society right now. I think um, we have people who are acting out in the way uh, that these crew were acting out and who are rebelling against the system. I think that's uh, <laughs> how would I say perhaps an understatement. Uh, they really are acting out, and it's broad-based, and it's it's a symptom of a lack of what you might call faith in the pathway uh, that we're on. And and by the way, many I, I want to underscore a book that you and I haven't discussed, but uh, John Shields and a woman named Sarah, I think it's Mur- uh have uh, I'll, her her. Uh, let me get her name correct, but but they wrote a book called Trump's Democrats, where they really did field research about what kind of people were the ones that had been historically Democrats, what kind of communities. And it really got to that notion of patronage and local control and local connection dissipating in traditional places that had been part of the Democratic Party or Democratic machine. And then all of a sudden it uh, it sort of, uh, how would I say, the way Donald Trump presented himself in 2015 and 16, the system is rigged and you got to rise with me to change this. He was reconnecting in a way they felt disconnected from. Mm. And uh, it was really quite a... Uh, it was really quite, uh, how would I say, a powerful book, not not from the standpoint of what we want, but in diagnosing the tragedy. The woman's name, by the way, was Stephanie Mur- Murevchik mm. and John Shields. And, uh, and I, I remember a book in England, David Goodhart wrote, uh, The Road to Somewhere, where the somewhere was a local connection and, and community and the nowheres were essentially with the, you know, globalized Mm. elites. And uh, so I I really think these, how do I call it, the human connections are important. One of the things, by the way, we haven't discussed is this recent movement by places like the Business Roundtable and others to emphasize that shareholder value is no longer the ethic, that stakeholder value. Yes. And and they're taking, they're acknowledging responsibility to environment workers. When you were talking about stock buybacks, I look at the very intense and well-developed work of William Lozonic, which is, uh, as some of which is Inet Grant. And he talks about how it's not just creating the incentives and the bonuses, it's creating the incentives to do stock buybacks to enhance the stock option bonuses rather than investing in the, what I'll call modernization or expansion of the capital stock, which provides a higher productivity platform for everybody in the future. Mm, yes. And, and when top managements fear that they could, through things beyond their control, be removed from office, they have an incentive to shorten their horizon and do too much in that realm. But I'm curious how you see 
with your investigation of norms and values and in, intra-human relationship, this movement of corporations away from the Milton Friedman model of, uh, of shareholder value or the Michael Jensen uh, carried it on after that. So I, I, my hope is that we will see a real change in, uh, in, in the kind of models that corporations follow. Um, and, um, you know, I think if you, if you look at the sort of history of corporations, there have been some really profound changes in the models that they follow um, over time. Um, so, I mean, you see, for instance, um, you know, following Sloan, the rise of these um, multi-divisional uh, organizations, and that becomes a huge uh, trend. Um, so there, there are these trends that happen. If you look at um, coming back to schools, I, I think we've um, schools used to operate um, somewhat more um, like the military. They saw it as their job to shape and mold uh, their students. And I think schools have gotten out of that game. Um, and um, so I think arguably one of, one of the reasons that they got out of that game um, is um, that it became something that was seemed too fraught for them to try to impose uh, values on people. Um, so there's a very good book I'd recommend called Shopping, Shopping Mall High. Uh, I, I don't remember the name of the author right now, but, um, but this book looks at a particular school and how it changed. And a key um, factor that, that led to this change, that, so that the images they turned from a school uh, where they shaped who you were, like the military, to a shopping mall. It was up to you to choose who to be and, and what classes to take. And, and that was all just left to you. So they got out of the values business. Uh, so a key thing that, that changed the school uh, was, um, was uh, integration following civil rights. So in that time when the school was being integrated, there was tension between uh, whites and blacks getting into this business of, of shaping people's values became something very fraught. So I think, um, I think we need to think about how to get back into that business. I hope we, we are. Uh, we also have to, I think, reckon with, um, uh, with some of the challenges to, that, um, that organizations may face in trying to do that. So um, maybe that's easier for corporations than for schools. Um, but I, I think, I, I hope that we'll see a change in model. I think, I hope that economics will, um, uh, e I think economics has, um, has, uh, sort of propelled a set of shifts in, in the organizational model towards things like, uh, these bonuses, um, and, and stock options. I hope that will propel now a shift, uh, back toward, toward, uh, firms, um, uh, molding who people are. Well, I guess uh, there are so many more things we could talk about. Are there other are there other parts of this mosaic of exploration? You know, you've talked about family, talked about education, you talked about self esteem versus the influence of the group. I'm I'm, I'm curious what what have we not touched on? I obviously, like to come back and do some deeper dives with you on the specifics and. Uh, potentially make a course together, that but I, uh, I'm, I'm, cu I'm, but I'm curious right now, what, uh, what else would you like to explore today? So, I mean, I think that, um, you know, take, taking us a, a step back, um, that, um, it, you know, I think as economists, we have to do more than just criticize the kind of classical, uh, model that, that fails to think about how people are socially influenced, that fails to uh, take into account uh, people as uh, being driven by moral considerations. And we need to try and build an alternative 
model. I think that's that's the real way to take a step forward is to do that. So I think we've touched a little bit on on some of um, the progress that's being made in that regard. So I think there's a kind of nascent movement within economics, which is very exciting toward toward doing that. And I think I think somehow we need we need to in particular develop new economic theory. So I think there's there's a lot of empirical work these days, which is showing that these things are important, and that's important and that's exciting. Um, I think there's less work, there's some work, but there's less work in the theory space that um, that is trying to t- tell us what if people aren't individualistic, um, wh- what are they like? What uh, and and it's uh, it's not a completely simple challenge to do that. So I think. Uh, we talked about some elements of that. So I think um, esteem is one critical element that drives people, um, this desire both for self-esteem and peer esteem. And that plays a role both in shaping individuals, but then shaping, but people, I think, form then a culture out of that. So I think, um, so I think understanding kind of what people's individual motivations are that drive them and shape them socially and morally. And then, uh, then there's the further task I think we need to think about, which is um, that that creates an inequilibrium. So these people who socially influence each other, there's an equilibrium there. Um, so we, the, I, I think I mentioned this at the beginning of our conversation. We normally talk about the equilibrium of what people do, taking who they are, as fixed, but there's also an equilibrium, um, of, uh, who people are. And, um, so I think that's, that's an important space that I've been trying to explore in my work and, um, and, and, uh, and there are others, uh, people like, uh, say Roland Benobu and Jean Tirole, um, who are, who are trying to explore that, um, in their work. And I think, so I think we need, uh, to, to, to think about uh, how that process of cultural formation works. And I think um, that, you know, one lesson there is that, um, that, that there, there tend to be multiple equilibria in this space, um, which is another way of saying that culture isn't something that's totally reducible. Um, so I think as economists, we tend to, um, to want to always come back to individuals and always reduce things to individuals. But culture is something, because there are multiple equilibria, that, that is non-reducible. And, and I think that relates to this Clifford Gertz quote, that, you know, we, we spin these webs of meaning. These are, that's, that's the idea of we interact with each other and we create an equilibrium. There are things we value. There are things we believe. There are stories we tell. These are things that we collectively create, but that then have a life of their own. We can't reduce it to individuals. And, um, and that's something that as economists, we, we need to know what those stories are if we are to know how people will behave because they're, you know, they're, they're systems of, uh, they're part of the system we can't predict just from looking at the individuals. We need to know uh, also what those stories are. Well, I say uh, when I was a little bit younger, I used to live in uh, part of Manhattan where I'd walk to work down Madison Avenue. And I used to walk down Madison Avenue by the, some of the offices of the very large uh, advertising firms. And I used to smile and say, well, you don't exist and you don't exist and you don't exist. But then I looked one time at the curriculum for an MBA at either Stanford, Northwestern, Wharton. Harvard in the Sloan School as I was studying curriculum. And I realized that marketing plays a very large role in business school education, unlike economics, where the preferences are uh, assumed by presupposition to be preformed. And so uh, I, I've, I've always kind of laughed about those days walking by and understanding that there was some, which you might call intuitively understanding there was a missing link in economics. And I think you're giving, you're not just, as you said, criticizing economics, you're trying to fill the void. And I, and I very much respect and appreciate 
that that aspect or I, I, all of your work, but but I think that courage is in that realm between making a difference socially and self-esteem as distinct from what you might call the, the, the conformity to the trophies that the profession offers. And you're doing pretty good with those too. Thank you. Well, I guess, uh, I guess if I were going to conclude, I would have to do something now, which has to do with the economics and family and everything else, which is, I, as you know, spend a lot of time with young people around the world, aspiring economists. I often give speeches about how the famous, uh, how would I say, Jungian mythologist, Joseph Campbell, used to talk about early in your life, you're a warrior. You're out to accomplish, you're out to build things. And then later in your life, you become a wizard. You become a mentor. You start to impart and to teach others. And I would say you're as good a warrior as exists in economics. And I would also say that you're, you're a, a wizard of wisdom well before your time. That's very kind. Thank you. And I want to pay tribute to my dear friend, whose last name is Akerlof, who is your father. He is one of those people that you come across just a handful of times in your life. He has made as much or more difference to the Institute for New Economic Thinking than any, any person that I've encountered. He wrote a book with Rachel Cranton called Identity Economics that touched upon these areas. And he's maintained a purposeful conviction in his own progress, in his own work, even after winning a Nobel Prize, that the, I would say in the pendulum of pure esteem and self-esteem, he's a person who's got all the trophies of pure esteem, but he's done it through maintaining a focus inward on the self-esteem and what can be achieved and what's got integrity. So you come from a good place, but what I really wanted to do is congratulate your father huh. on being the father of Robert Akerlof. That's very nice. Uh... Because unto yourself, you are marvelous. <laughs> but... He, he should take pride in that, and I wanted to underscore that today. So I've been very fortunate to have him, of course, as a father, but also um, as an intellectual mentor. So it's, you know, it's it's the, I, I, I won the lottery there, and uh, <laughs> I, I've, I've been extremely fortunate. And um, he's played a, a big role in setting me on this uh, intellectual journey that, that I'm on, and uh, I'm fortunate to... Uh, be able to talk about these things with him, and uh, and and uh, it, it's uh, it's a wonderful thing to be able to uh, work on these things together, talk about these things together. Um, yeah. And you know, I see for a lot of young people, I think about my own students that there are these difficult choices that they face uh, as they're starting their careers that. Um, the incentives really aren't there to, to make these kind to, to work on some of these difficult problems. Um, these are things we need to do, and, and the incentives um, aren't there. So I've I've been fortunate to have guidance from my father, Rachel Cranton, and a number of other mentors that have allowed me to um, to do that. And I I think you know we should think about how to give more space to young people to take leaps. Uh, and take take more risks, uh, and I think that that's critical for uh, making progress as a field. And um, and and I think uh, economics changing is is critical for um, for for a broader change in society that we need. Well, I agree with you on all counts, and I also want to point out about you, Robert Akerlof, 
you had the good judgment not to rebel too much from your father. You know, a lot of people get their identity from being different than That's right. We've been talking about that. And, and you had a certain inner strength so that you could go back to the nourishment that he provides. That's right. And, and help, how would I say, use it as an ally in cultivating yourself. And that's a different source of strength. Once again, apple doesn't fall far from the tree. I think there's some internal strength and self-esteem that you have cultivated. But uh, you're on, you're on a, a very, very powerful path. And I hope that you'll come back and join me and we can continue to uh, address these questions and, and visit about the challenges that uh, the world and the Institute for New Economic Thinking and you and I face. I would be delighted anytime. Very good. Thanks. We'll Thank talk you. again soon. Great. Bye-bye. And check out more from the Institute for New Economic Thinking at ineteconomics.org.